Today's video discusses measurement and data. Uh, when we do research, we particularly quantitative research, we need a way to take concepts that we have and convert those concepts into measurements that allow us to do statistical analysis. So we use a number of different kinds of measuring devices. For example, the most common measuring device in sociology is probably the survey. And the survey that we'll use this semester is the General Social Survey which is available to us online and for free with an analysis package called SDA that we'll introduce later on. The General Social Survey goes out and collects information from thousands of people every two years. It's done so since 1972 and asks people some behavioral questions about things that they do, but mostly ask them attitudinal questions. Those questions are then coded or given numbers so that they can be used by a computer for statistical analyses. So this is really not much different than other kinds of research, for example, medical research, where you might take blood pressure and temperature and uh, uh, blood levels and so forth, blood chemistry, and use that to evaluate a patient. Uh, we're using similar kinds of instruments or analogously instruments to uh, collect uh, attitudinal and behavioral information. Now we do this primarily so that we can use a computer so that we can go ahead and tabulate these results and do a statistical analysis. Measurement uh, can really be as complicated a topic as you want it to be. There's a philosophical uh, existential level to understanding measurement and there's also more a more tangible level and that's where we're going to spend our time. Uh, it's interesting to note that there's some things that are difficult to measure, like gravity. There really is no objective, you can't measure or observe gravity directly. You can only observe how gravity operates on objects. And there's been a great deal of standardization so that people measure gravity similarly. But remember, you're not actually measuring gravity, just how gravity operates on objects. In the social sciences, um, we have some tangible measures. Uh, we know when people are born, we know their age, we know if they're married, the number of children, the number of years of education, the year that they died, and so forth. Those are fairly clear and tangible measures. But when we start getting into cognitive concepts, intelligence, attitudes, people's uh, favoring or not favoring capital punishment or abortion, their values and their beliefs, then the situation is a lot more difficult to get good and accurate measurements that actually measure the thing that we think we're measuring. Now most of the information that you'll get on measurement will take place in your next course, SOCY202, and we're going to leave most of that discussion till then. But I just want to make certain you understand that there is uh, some complexity here. Let's now turn to a, a topic like poverty and try to understand how we can measure poverty. It turns out that poverty itself is a difficult thing to measure, the concept of poverty. If we sat down in a group, we could come up with very many ways of, of understanding what poverty is. Poverty might be income-based. It might be based on caloric intake. It might be based on living conditions, whether you have indoor plumbing or not, and, and uh, cell phones and so forth. It could be based on property. Which is the correct measurement? So we, what we need to do is create what's called a variable, and a variable is something used to denote a measured concept. So the variable here we might call poverty. Poverty is not a constant. That is, not everybody has the same level of poverty. If it was a constant, it wouldn't be a variable. So I know that's a bit tautological, but a variable is something that can vary before we go out and measure things. So we develop the concept, poverty. We define what it is and how to measure it, and then we assume that people will have different levels of it that will be differentiated along a continuum or a spectrum of poverty. Now, in the United States, there is an official definition of poverty, and um, we could use that definition, even though it may not be suitable for all of our purposes. So here's what we get when we look at the uh, uh, official U.S. government definition of poverty in 2012. If you are in a family household of three people, the poverty level is $19,090, meaning that if your household income is lower than that, then you are in poverty, and if it is above that, then you are not in poverty. To get these kinds of measurements, 
one has to define consistently what poverty is. In this case, to understand poverty, we would need to know family income and family size to be able to operationalize the concept poverty. Operationalization is the term that we use when we move from concepts to measurement. For example, we might use a survey to ask people before taxes, what is the amount of money that you make from all sources? So there's our income-based measure of poverty. Then we could also ask, what is the number of persons in your household, including only yourself, spouse, and all dependents? That's how we get our number of people in the family. Then we would use the guidelines defined by the United States, the government of the United States, and we would classify people's answers according to those guidelines. If they're under the sum threshold, then they are in poverty. If they're not, then they are, if they're over that threshold, then they are not in poverty. There's lots of ways of measuring poverty, not just by income. And uh, one measure may be suitable for some purposes and not for others. So there's multiple measures of poverty. And each time you talk about poverty, you should understand which kind of measure is being used, where the data are coming from, and how it's being operationalized. Then you're in a better position to understand any statistical results. It's really the purpose of this course, to teach you how to produce statistics, not to produce data. Uh, to understand what the statistics mean. We can define or divide data into two general groups, qualitative and quantitative data. So qualitative data basically are characterized by categories, and the categories share two key characteristics. The categories are mutually exclusive and exhaustive. And what we mean by mutually exclusive is that you can be in one and only one category. What is meant by exhaustive is that there's a category for every outcome. So, for example, if I wanted to measure sex, I would come up with categories male and female. And presumably, if it's a good categorization scheme, a good operationalization, everybody in my sample would be assigned to either male or female. Nobody would be assigned to both. And there would be a category for everybody. If I change my concept to something like gender, this sort of two-category characterization of sex is probably not adequate. Where do transgendered people fit into that particular category? They don't. So the categories are either not exhaustive or they are not mutually exclusive. And we'd have to come up with a different coding scheme, a different set of rules and definitions, so that people could be unambiguously assigned to one and only one category. Basically, when you have qualitative data, you're able to answer the question, if you have two things from a sample, they're either the same or they're different. With quantitative data, when we assign a number to some outcome, some measurement outcome, in addition to uh, being able to state whether two things taken from our sample are equal or unequal, we can also talk about whether one is greater than or less than the other. So some examples of this are years of education. Some people have 15 years of education, others have 12. So here we know that one, the person with 15 has more education than the person with 12. Quantitative data versus qualitative data contain more numeric information, and therefore we can do more sophisticated statistical analyses on quantitative data versus qualitative data. Let's be a little more specific. Uh, within the qualitative data, we have what are called discrete variables. And there's really two kinds of discrete variables. There are non-orderable discrete variables and orderable discrete variables. When you hear the word discrete, what we're really talking about is putting things into categories, classifying people or objects, events, to uh, the kind or quality of their attributes. If we have a non-orderable discrete variable, then we're talking about something where the order is irrelevant. So if we ask people their musical preference, and they can respond blues, classical, rap, jazz, rock, uh, any number of different outcomes, we would be able to say that two people are similar with regard to their musical interests or dissimilar, they're equal or unequal, but we wouldn't be able to say that one is greater than the other or one is less than the other. If we have orderable discrete variables, the sequence of the categories matters. So for example, social class. Uh, down below you'll see it's, I have social class listed as lower, middle, and upper. 
Now, we don't know what this means in terms of actual measurement. Is this measured in terms of education, income, occupation, or a combination of all those things, or something else? We don't really know. But we do know from the titles of the categories, the lower, the middle, and the upper, that there's an ordering here that whatever it is we're measuring, people in the lower category have less of it than people in the middle category, who in turn have less of it, whatever it is, than people in the upper category. Notice also that um, uh, Likert scales fall here. So here we have, uh, for a, a Likert scale, people are asked, uh, given a statement and are asked the uh, extent to which they disagree or agree with it. So these letters down here stand, the SD stands for strongly disagree, D for disagree, neither agree nor disagree, agree and strongly agree. Technically, this is an ordinal discrete variable. However, if you have multiple Likert type variables and you make an index out of them or a scale out of them, then it's possible that you could calc that you could analyze these as quantitative variables. And we'll show in just a minute. There's a special case of our discrete variables, and that's a dichotomous variable. And it's simply the case where you only have two categories. So clearly you satisfy the mutually exclusive and exhaustive uh, kind of attributes for measurement. So mutually exclusive, an object belongs to one and only one category, and exhaustive, there's a category for every object. Typically in the computer we store these values as 0 and 1, where 0 implies the absence of a characteristic, and 1 implies the presence of a characteristic. For example, people could be classified as poor and rich. So you, uh, you, have the pr you either have the characteristic of being poor, coded 0, or the characteristic of rich coded one. For our quantitative data, sometimes called continuous variables, in theory we have measurements that can take on all possible numerical variables, values in a given interval. So something like income, where we can measure it down to the nearest penny, which is probably too precise for, soci for sociology, but in theory is possible. We have sort of incrementally smaller measurements that we can apply and people could fall anywhere on this continuum. Uh, age. Uh, the General Social Survey asked people their age, and they coded as being between the ages of 18 and 89, or 89 and older. Uh, they don't interview people less than 18, and while they interview people older than 89, they code everybody 89 and older in one category. And they do that to mask their identities, to protect the, the identities of the people who participate in their research. Now, Age here looks like it's a discrete orderable variable, and in some sense it is. But in theory, we could measure age not just to the nearest uh, year, but to the nearest month or day or hour of the day or minute of the day or second of the day. In theory, there's an infinite number of measurements that we could, uh, precision that we could apply to this measurement. In practice, we round it to the nearest year. In fact, we typically round it downwards, not upwards. So somebody who is 19, year, 19 years and 363 days uh, will typically say they're 19 years old. That ends our discussion today. I hope you enjoyed this video, and we will discuss this in our labs. Thank you.